Good evening. This is Paul Chioko from uh, the Pacific Science Center. Not exactly, but at least my home um, in the in the in Seattle. Uh, and I am here to welcome you to tonight's virtual Science of Spirits with Glass Vodka. Thanks for joining us. Um, before we dive into the spirits, I'd like to give a few bits of information uh, just to get us started. First of all. Huge thank you to Glass Vodka for partnering with us. Um, it's an amazing opportunity to try out some really great vodka, um, but also to partner with a great partner, longtime uh, supporters of the Science Center. We hope you purchase the tasting kit um, to follow along at home. A um, couple different options that you have here. If you weren't able to, no worries. Grab something, uh, grab some vodka, and and you'll learn a little bit about both the science of vodka, but also about how to taste vodka, uh, and then get a chance to go down to glass vodka later on. Um, programming like this is made possible in part thanks to the generous support of donors. You know, for more than 50 years, PAXI has been igniting curiosity in kids and adults on a whole range of topics, right? Virtual reality, space, butterflies, insects, climate change, and yes, even spirits. But let's be clear, science and an informed public are humanity's best hopes in addressing COVID-19, climate change, and lots of other threats. Now, while we are closed to the public, we are still serving the community with programs that we can deliver digitally, just like this one. But we need your help to do it. PAXI depends on charitable support from the community, especially now. So thank you to those of you who have already made a gift. Um, and if you haven't, I ask you to consider donating by going to paxi.org slash support. I'll make it even easier, slash support slash donate. If you're able to, we suggest a $10 donation for tonight's event to help us ensure that curiosity never closes. Another big uh, thank you to all the PAXI members joining us tonight and those that are out there in the universe. We really appreciate your continued support. If you're not already a member, um, I recommend uh, for, especially for adults, the Fusion membership designed especially for adults. It includes passes to unique experiences like these happy hours, tasting events, laser shows, and the Science in the City evening lecture series. And all the more, supporting access to science education in Seattle and all across Washington. So to explore membership options, make sure uh, to visit paxi.org slash membership. During the event, feel free to ask questions and interact with us in YouTube. Um, I've got YouTube up here and I'll be tracking uh, your chat. We'd love to hear from you, especially um, if you're watching on your YouTube, uh, how many people are in the room with you there? We'd love to know that, if you can uh, put that into the YouTube chat. Tell us where you are, how you heard about the event, whatever, whatever questions you might have of our guest. And so here we go, right on to our event. We're gonna learn about the science behind distilling um, while tasting some samples, and then put our knowledge to work by creating a couple of cocktails, which any of my friends will know, I'm not the best at, I usually let somebody else do this, so this is gonna be a real learning for me. So who better to lead our exploration through the world of vodka uh, other than Glass Vodka's founder and head distiller, Ian McNeil. Ian is the founder of Glass Distillery uh, that began operations back in 2012, a whole universe time ago. He produces internationally acclaimed and award-winning collection of connoisseur class vodkas based right here in Seattle. His new guard spirits celebrate all that life has to offer about refinement and beauty to conflict and creativity. Ian, as I have gotten to know, is a Renaissance man. He's an entrepreneur, an artist, a pilot, a chef, a connoisseur of a variety of areas of, in life from food to wine, to spirits to travel, and a con consummate student of science, art, and life. Ian, thank you so much for joining me in this great tasting. Ian, join me. There he is. <laughs> That's awesome. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Glass Distillery. 
We are in the world of glass right now. Even though you can't be here, we wish you could be here. In fact, our tasting room is so small, I'm not sure that we could have all you people in here, but I'm glad to be here. And uh, It is quite beautiful. I was just there the other day. It's quite amazing. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for coming in and getting a tasting kit. We had lots of people get tasting kits, so I'm going to get set up here and uh, tell you a little bit about the science. I, I'm going to have to clean my hands, though, because... Oh, yeah. You know, you got to be safe. And uh, this is one of the things that we did early on called a pivot. We had to make hand sanitizer because we couldn't make vodka anymore. And really, that's about science, too. Uh, the alcohol that we use to make hand sanitizer is the same thing that we do to make these world-class spirits. We just don't water it down. And, uh, and then we add hydrogen peroxide. And we add a little glycerin to make your hands soft and, and it works. So it uh, smells good too. Yeah, and it smells good. Don't drink it. Yeah. Don't drink it. Don't, do, don't drink it. Yes. Hey, uh, Paul, you mentioned earlier that um, my wife and I, well, you may not have mentioned my wife, but my wife was on the board of uh, trustees for the Science Center. Uh, I'm that's awesome. Because this Tyvek suit is really hot. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you guys, um, I had the Tyvek suit because when you're mixing up 35% uh, hydrogen peroxide and, mm -hmm. and um, watering it down to what we use for the, um, uh, for the hand sanitizer, you really have to be quite careful with it. It is something that you can't get in your lungs. It'll burn your lungs. You can't get it on your hands. You can't get it on your skin. Um, but when you use it in, in very low concentrations, it's what allows us to have a, a really clean and pure hand sanitizer. That's what great. the World Health Organization, FDA, used to, uh, to uh, get all the distilleries on board really across the country to help us in the time of need during March through really the end of April, Paul. That was the, um, the time when the, the supply chain was just so messed up. So well, a lot awesome. of Amazing that you all stepped up to do that. That's just incredible. Yeah, and, 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 a, and a lot of us did, and I'm, I'm really happy that we did. Um, it's now sort of back to business and we're distilling. Uh, the whole world has changed. We don't get to do what we're doing for everybody right now with the uh, uh, with this tasting. But um, I'm so glad that we're getting to do this with you guys because we've been involved with the Science Center for more than 20 years. And um, uh, I'm just thrilled that we get to, uh, to talk to everyone about the, um, the, the, the science of distilling today. That's what I'm looking forward to. Uh I, you know, I know about vodka um, from, I think, uh, very first from my mother's uh, apple teeny. Yeah. Uh, I think that's about it. And I, I had plenty of vodka in my day, too. But I, I'm, because I work at the Science Center, I'm also really curious about how it's made and um, how you put all the flavors together to make it the kind of work that you do. So I'm looking forward to it. Great. Well, um Paul, you said it earlier, but I want to make sure that everybody hears this uh, directly from me as well. I want questions, and uh, I know there's a little touch of time delay in the chat, but keep them flying at me, and um, let's make it interactive while I'm going along so that if there's something people want to know, I'll, I'll answer it now, and then we can still answer it later once we've had a few tastes and, and cocktail right. questions get flowing more. But... I, I want this to be a learning experience. I want you to taste things that are that, that you may not have tasted before. If you snuck in and started tasting before tonight, well, <laughs> good, good on you. But that, but I want to <laughs> what I what I really wanted it to taste like when we created these products. But the one thing that I, I find um, that most people don't understand about vodka in general is that vodka can be made from any base material. So you this can, is what blew my mind. This is this, yeah. this is the part already blew my mind. You can make vodka from wheat, mm. rye, corn, potatoes, grapes. Wow. Like we make all of our products from grapes, but you can wow. really make it from anything. And it really comes down to the chemistry of it. And that mm -hmm. is you need something that serves as a source of sugar or starch okay. for an enzyme and yeast combination that that when these little microbes eat away at the sugar, they have two byproducts, two chemical reactions happen during the, this process. And we get the two things that come out is a carbon chain that is alcohol and carbon dioxide. 
And okay. what we really do in distillation is we take what that first stage of the chemistry, the chemical reaction is, and then we, we strip the water off of that and we basically purify the alcohols that are part of those different chains. And using heat, which is the distillation, mm -hmm. we break these various carbon chains off and then we collect that which we really want to drink that, that tastes a the, the certain way and is not harmful to our bodies mm -hmm. so long as you don't over consume. That's and right. that's ethyl alcohol. So mm -hmm. during the distillation process, there's really three stages. You, you have um, the first stage when you're heating up your kettle or your stills, it produces alcohols that boil at lower temperatures. So all you all just remember back to your high school chemistry class. And I know you all had a high school chemistry class where probably a teacher took three liquids and put them in a beaker. And then she said, or he said, boil this and find out what the boiling temperatures of the alcohol or of the substances in there. One probably boiled at 150, another one at 190, another one at 210. So there was really big differentiation. And then you found out the volume of those liquids based on their boiling points. Well, really distilling alcohol is the same thing, but we're looking to, to break apart about oh, 12 to 14 different alcohols and try and find that one sweet alcohol that, that all alcohols really are made up of, whether it's rum or vodka or gin or tequila, and that's ethyl alcohol. So we cut off things like acetone, methanol, Fruferol, butanol, all these different alcohol chains, and we look to arrive at just at the alcohol. And you're filtering that out through the distillation process. It's it's more of a uh, a process by which instead of filtering it alcohol, yeah. you actually you're boiling, you're watching the temperatures in the kettle, and you use the still and really just directional valves in, in a very small scale production like my. Uh, the folks in the in the craft distillery business, you're doing it sort of manually. The really big companies like like uh, you, you name it, like Bacardi and Tito's, there it's an automated computer process. But we're doing it by taste and smell and temperature and sight, and we're nice. watching hydrometers to make sure we see the, the the alcohol percentages. And then we physically move a lever like this and direct it into tanks. And so we separate off. The first stuff that comes off, it's called the heads. We separate those off. We don't want to drink those. They're very volatile alcohols. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them are even poisonous. Mm -hmm. um, the center part, we call the hearts. And the hearts is really what vodka is all about. Mm -hmm. And vodka, you've heard vodka is very clean. You've heard the, the descriptive terms of very, very pure. People like to drink it because it doesn't, uh, it has less burn than other alcohols. It's because... You have to distill vodka as a classified alcohol by our alcohol, the TTB in the United States, as alcohol distilled to at least 190 proof. Okay. And proof. What that means. Yeah, tell me what that means. That proof one is twice. If you take the number of the percent of alcohol of the, of the volume of alcohol, proof sure. is just a measure of twice the, per, the percentage alcohol. So yeah. at 190 proof, it's 95% pure ethyl alcohol. Wow. That's what vodka is. Sure. So now you go back to what we started saying is vodka can be made from wheat, mm -hmm. rye, corn, potatoes, you name it, grapes, other fruits. And I mean, so crazy. There are distilleries. I know of one in Vermont, another one in London that make it from lactose. What's lactose? Coming off the cows, the, the milk? Yeah, it's the milk sugar. Wow. So the milk sugar, some people are even, you know, they, they don't even process that milk sugar correctly uh, in their, their digestive system. But there are distilleries that take that lactose and ferment it and harvest that off and then distill that alcohol. That's brilliant. What, what vodka does, because it's so pure and the ethyl alcohol is so pure, there's very little flavor left. Mm -hmm. and there's very little aromatics left. Mm -hmm. But just recently, as in June of this year, mm -hmm. the classification of the, the legal classification of vodka as classified by the uh, TTB in the United States was reclassified and they changed the description. Mm -hmm. So it used to be, you all, it used to be 
colorless, odorless, tasteless, distilled to at least 190 proof, and then watered back down with water. Well, I'm here to tell you right now, whatever your favorite brand of alcohol, uh, of vodka is, we could line up 10 shot glasses and I could pour it blind. You may not be able to describe everything, but I promise you, you would say, yeah, that tastes different. And mm. you could smell it. You go, that smells different. Right. So no one's really meeting the legal classification system of what the TTB put in place. So they finally, since prohibition started, <laughs> and ended, they finally changed it. And what that does, that gives us sort of a, um, I was told I was not going to do that, put my foot on my bar. Um, that gives us more of a justification for what we've been preaching for the last eight years since I've made this. And that is making really high quality vodka from wine grapes is just like making a beautiful wine. And there is bouquet to it. And there is flavor to it. And there is viscosity in your mouth to it. But if we do that, and we do it in such a way that we celebrate it so that it is different, it is sort of a new guard way. We've mm -hmm. now just gotten the TTV to back us up with what we've been saying for eight years and that there's a definition that needs you're, to be You're on the vanguard, man. You're on the vanguard. We have a said, question that came through. Does anybody ever go above 190 proof? It's, you know what? It's, it's nearly impossible because okay. the, the relationship to heat mm -hmm. and time mm -hmm. and, and how much energy it takes to get the last bit of alcohol to break off from the chain of water it's, um, it's not a linear relationship. So what do I mean by linear relationship? Well, you know, our X to Y graph. If it was linear, the graph would look just like this. It actually yep. looks like this, you guys. And by the time you get out here of where the percent of alcohol gets up to around 95%, it takes so much heat and time that sure. the relative amount is not. So where you find alcohols that are higher than really 95%, like 96, 97, 98, those are alcohols that are distilled for industrial purposes in, right. in refineries, not small craft distilleries, sure, or sure, even sure. distilleries like Absolute. They, they, their energy use and, and time doesn't allow for such things like that. So this is great. I, I, I've gotten a lot out of it already. I, I've learned, I, now I have a much better explanation of what proof means. I can go back and tell somebody about that now. Are you, are you drilling yet? Cause I, I can't wait. I've got them all right here. <laughs> yeah. um, now I'm going to lay one more bit of information out. Then we're going to start into the, the tastings. Okay. Great. So if, it, if things can be distilled from anything, uh, or fog can, can be distilled from any base material. And if it's distilled and it's just ethyl alcohol and water, Paul, do you know what a gluten is? Do you know what gluten is? Well, it's that thing in the wheat that holds it together. Right. So yeah. I think it is, right? And, yeah. And you know what that thing is? That thing is a protein. Okay. And some people, some people, some humans don't process that protein, the gluten mm -hmm. in wheat, as well as other people. Right. And, um, and some people, it, it's bad enough. It's a serious allergic reaction. Other people do it for dietary re reasons or what have you. Sure. But for the most part, it's, it's people having this, it's a, it's a protein that people are allergic to. I'm here to tell you, and clarify for everybody, your favorite booze does not have gluten in it. <laughs> you don't have to be Tito's to be told that corn doesn't have gluten or grapes. But I'm telling you, neither does Absolute. Absolute mm. made from wheat. There's no gluten. Because that protein can't survive being sure. boiled at 200 degrees Fahrenheit. And there's no way for it to come into a vapor and then be turned back into a solid because if that protein could do that, we could go over to Star Trek and start beaming ourselves all around the world by distilling ourselves. You heard it here, people. We're, we're getting ready to beam ourselves across the universe. <laughs> anyway, great product yeah. for you right here. We, we actually had to test it. And I, I sent in things from Grey Goose, Cattle One, Tito's, Glass Vodka. And um, we had to do blind tests and, and send it to our, our labs. And when I asked them to do gluten tests, they sort of laughed at me. And they said, what are you testing? I said, it's ethyl alcohol. And they said, there's no gluten in it. I said, could you please just give me the results? So don't fall for it, people. If no gluten. If you like to drink rum, there's no gluten in it. And if you like vodka, drink your favorite brand. I hope it's glass. But 
it doesn't have gluten in it. That is unless they put it in there. So without further ado, <laughs> shall we taste some vodka? Let's do it. Okay. So um, what you got in your tasting kits, you guys, um, instead of trying to send you all these big, heavy crystal bottles, you got a bottle of glass vodka. This is my, uh, this is our signature vodka. It's what I started with. Glass vodka is distilled from 100% Washington wine grapes. We get those from here. It's mostly, I'll tell you, it, it's mostly fruit that we get from Chateau Saint-Michel over in the Columbia Valley. Oh, nice. We take that wine and we distill the alcohol out of it and we continue the process of distilling. And, I'll, and one thing that we don't do that many brands brag about, they brag about how many times they filter the product. Mm. We don't filter the product. We clarify the product using um, cellulose plates, plant-based plates, and a very natural clay, uh, clay impregnated plate. And all it does is remove any um, soluble fats or proteins that might be left over from some process in the, the product, but there aren't any. I mean, it's so perfectly off, clear so, all the way through. Yeah, you, you, in fact, you see how it sparkles in the bottle? Yeah, Think absolutely. Way, Paul, if you were to, um, if you were to get a bottle of perfume and it was cloudy, you probably wouldn't be impressed with it. Mm -hmm. If you got a bottle of Chardonnay or a bottle of uh, a Rosé and it didn't sparkle in the bottle, you probably wouldn't be very impressed. Right. The way they get that to that sparkling finish is to run that through a very low number micron filter and it just polishes it. So it doesn't remove aromatics and it doesn't remove flavor but it does remove particles that might reflect light so it doesn't look clear. Right. That's what we do because I want everything to, to be preserved in this product. And so you can taste the heritage of where this product came from. And that is the, the Washington wine grapes. I love so, it. Um, if you want to add some ice to your glass, any, yeah. kind, of, any kind of glass that you all have there, you can use. We like to use a stemmed glass. This is actually a vodka or a tequila oh. tasting glass. It doesn't, if you see this, it doesn't have a bowl. It's just straight up. So your nose can absorb the aromatics without having it get flooded with um, uh, alcohol vapor. In the professional world, everybody tastes things at room temperature because it gives you a, a more full body experience in your mouth. Um, it, it, when, you, when things are chilled, you taste them less. There's a reason that people want to drink things very cold. Mm -hmm. But in this case, when we're trying to learn about these subtle differences, let's try it at room temperature. When you're trying this at home, you guys, get yourself a glass. And for those of you who might be confused about how to open the bottle, you're not alone. And I've had a couple different I, iterations. I was right there with y'all, people. Okay, so... Right on the front here, I'll get it as close to the camera as I can. There's a little piece of tape that comes off this little buckle. It's like a horse bit or a uh, Cartier bracelet for our crystal bottle. What you want to do is break that little tab, open your buckle, pull us the little bit, and voila. Oh, Paul, good job, man. That's even better than during rehearsal. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so let's let's give this a whirl. Everybody open up your bottle of glass vodka. If you want to get really fancy, and I'm telling you, I didn't know this until a year ago, and I've been doing this eight years, almost nine years. I had a bartender show me this little trick. If you take your stopper out, set that down there, and then put the buckle back on, the stopper back, I mean the collar back on your, your, uh, your bottle, you can put it on there and then put your stopper back in and back out. Now, mm. even I didn't do this originally, but uh, the bartenders were telling me it's too beautiful to not have them. And if you drink yourself an entire case, you'll have six of these and perfect number of napkin rings for your next dinner party, Paul. See? Thanks. Okay. It also works very well. I'll keep that right there to put your stopper on so it doesn't go rolling off the table. So. <laughs> Each one of these um, uh, little vials that you have as we go through the next ones, you guys, this is a, a full two ounces. It's actually a little bit more than two ounces, but it's a two ounce sample. If you decide you want to drink all of these, 
right now, you might not make it till the cocktail at the end, but I encourage you to um, uh, pour maybe about a quarter of an ounce so you make it to the end, okay? But Paul, to each his own, okay? This, this is true, right. So, I would give it like, that's plenty for a tasting. Just like a glass of wine, you might swirl it around a little bit. It just kind of gets the alcohol moving up and down the glass. You'll see that um, the alcohol in this glass, just like a wine, it's pretty viscous. If mm -hmm. uh, if you've done wine tastings before, they'll talk about having legs. I think the you legs, can see yeah. that camera there. So that viscosity comes from the kind that the alcohol and how we produce it. And because we're not charcoal filtering, it's not ripping out some of those things. Um, I like to smell the alcohol first. So Paul, do this with me. For, for those of you at home, watch this and take a big deep breath. If you wanna get the, the best flavor mm. through the aromatics, you wanna do it with your mouth open, okay? Okay. So, and you, you inhale, and I, I think what you'll find is what I see, it almost smells sweet because mm -hmm. it's got a very floral nature to it. And this smell in any of these alcohols that, that you would smell, and it doesn't matter if you're smelling tequila or whiskey or rum or different vodkas, the things that you smell on a clear spirit like this are those, um, those compounds that attach themselves to the alcohol chain, that carbon chain that is the alcohol. And that's what gives it the aromatics. And the more you distill it and the more you rip it out through carbon filtering, the more you take those things away. I, I think that if you guys are doing this with me at home and you're smelling this, that floral sweetness, it's almost like a honeysuckle sweetness that you smell to it. And I don't want to strip that out when we're distilling. So that's why we don't charcoal filter. So now when Keep you taste there. it, Ooh. taste a little bit at the front of your mouth. And I think yeah. what you'll find is you get a little bit of sweetness at the front of your mouth, right in the front of your tongue. And then it kind of rests on the side of your jaw and you feel it warming at the side of your jaw. <laughs> yes. But then I, I find that there's not a, a really deep, hot burn with this vodka. Mm -hmm. And that's because the vodka itself has a pretty low pH. We mm -hmm. know the pH scale from um, basic to acidic. So this is a lower number, uh, uh, acidic number. And so those, those acid num that acid sort of hits you at the side of your jaw and then activates your, your salivary glands and it makes your mouth water a little bit. So it gives it that, that smooth, viscous feel in your mouth. And it doesn't feel thin. It, it feels like it's got body, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to pass it on to my husband. Does he let him try, right. try it too? Yeah, sniff it first, but then taste it. Yeah, I like it. It is. It's not a very strong. It's not, it's not harsh at all. Thank you. Thank you. And it's really, we, we distill our, our vodka very slowly. I yeah. bet you if there's a question up there, someone is asking right now, how many times do we distill it? Anybody asking that yet? I haven't seen it yet, but yeah, that's, that's what I'm thinking. Here's the answer. The distillation number of times really doesn't particularly matter. It's the process. And mm -hmm. so that number that people have heard before, oh, it's distilled seven times or five times or three times or 10 times. That really was a way that one distiller would communicate to another distiller about the process in which they made that alcohol. It was like, a, a, like a, a subtle way of asking a question. Sure. And about 25 years ago, some really good marketers came up with the idea of like, hey, if someone's asking that question, that makes it sound good. Maybe if we say it's five times, it's better. Well, if, if you... If you have a certain number of people saying that for a long enough period of time, then someone must just think that seven times must be good enough. Must what be good. Say, what do you say it was distilled 30 times? Well, then you know what happens? People start calling BS. <laughs> ah, it's not distilled 30 times. Can't believe it. That's a consumer saying that. Well, the reality is, is that once you get past doing something in batch and you have to do it several times to get to a level of purity, Commercially viable distilleries use what's called continuous process distillation. And they mm -hmm. use columns that are 
several hundred feet high. Usually they have to be cut in sections and they're like refineries, like Tito's. Sure. Sure. Tito is not made in a still that's on the bottle anymore. That is a serious industrial process. Sure. And it's made 24 hours, seven days a week in a continuous still, meaning corn mash goes in one side and out the other side of the still comes 190 proof alcohol and then they water it back down. And it just keeps running and running and running. That's Our stills produce, oh, 25 liters an hour, <laughs> 30 <laughs> liters an hour at full scale. Um, those big distilleries like Absolute, Smirnoff, Kettle One, Tito's, Bacardi, think of those. Think of opening up a fire hydrant sure. and just letting the pressure go on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's what their stills look like. So um, you've got your still right there in, in the building with you? We are. We're right down in Soto, uh, two blocks from Mariner Stadium, and, and our stills, we installed them. I had them made in uh, in Germany specifically for making huh? vodka from wine grapes because huh? one of the other things we make, we haven't started selling it yet. We, we also make brandy, which is a natural uh, uh, you know, use of grapes in the distillation process. Sure. Our, our brandies are only nine years old. I really want to wait till they're 10 years old before we release them, but um, uh all of our taste tests have revealed some pretty beautiful products. Uh, I can't wait. That's good. There'll be some left by the time we go to sell it. <laughs> okay, so that's, just, that's vodka just with with no flavoring whatsoever. This is just no flavoring whatsoever. No uh, charcoal filtering whatsoever. It's just a beautiful, clean spirit. And what I do like about that is it's a lovely martini. Um, over the years, we've learned different. Um, different things that you add. Some people like things uh, like a dirty martini. So that's going to have mm -hmm. a lot of olive juice. Um, some people just like an olive and different kinds of stuffed olives. Um, a lemon twist is very nice. Mm -hmm. um, a good friend of mine, Rob Noakes, a bartender down at the Metropolitan Grill, a number of years ago, he told us, you know, I really like the flavor of this, but if you ever tried this with a, uh, an orange twist, and I, I, we've got a whole following of people now that just love this with an orange twist. And really, the citrus uh, from an orange or from a lime or from a lemon goes well because the, the pH, the balance of the, the spirit anyway, already has a, a pH tendency. So it just goes well with that. And but then so these, well. something like this has got a different kind of flavor that's infused into it. Yeah. So what we're going to do now, you guys, in, in order so that you don't... Um, waste your tongue away with some of the, the stronger flavors of coffee and, and spice. Go and, and look at your one that's, this is that you're gonna go with the glass nectar, okay? Right, so glass nectar is glass vodka at 40% alcohol, 40 or 80 proof. All of our vodkas are 80 proof. That's sort of, that's also different. The industry doesn't usually do that. Flavored vodkas are usually 35, 38%. So uh, again, you can pour a little bit, Paul, and then if you want to just give the bottle to your husband. <laughs> I know he's sitting there going, give me that. <laughs> and, and if you're doing this at home and you've got a group of people around, really, you guys, two ounces, that's really good enough for four or five tastes. You can share this around. Yeah. Um, and, and that's plenty of, uh, of vodka for a group. You've of got people as far away as squim at this point. Oh, uh, right. Bellingham, uh, let's see who else have we got. Um, right here in Seattle, so uh, we've got people all over the place. Right, hey Bellingham. Hey, so this is glass vodka that's been infused with real honey. And when I started huh. making this product back in, uh, this would have been uh, about seven years ago, I had a partnership with the Salish Lodge up there at Snoqualmie Falls and some oh, good course. friends were up there and wanted me to make a, a honey vodka for them. And you, there are honey vodkas. So again, Paul, what did we learn? You can use a sugar and ferment mm -hmm. it and then extract the alcohol, but that takes a lot of honey to do that. And okay. uh, they have hives that they maintain up on top of Snoqualmie Falls. And I said, let's not use all your honey. Uh, that was the nice way really of saying, I don't want 300 pounds of honey in my stills and I don't want <laughs> sugar like that all over my distillery because it'd be just a mess. But I was very nice and said, how about if we do this? 
we'll take some honey and we'll add it to the product. So I think you can see on the camera right there, see how clear it is? And it's yeah. very, it's, it's polished and it's golden in color. That's because we take a, the equivalent of about two tablespoons of honey mm. for every bottle. Wow. And we take this honey in 50 pound batches mm. and we add high proof vodka or high proof alcohol. It's not quite vodka because we haven't added one. And we use these big kettles and my colleague and I, mostly my colleague, uh, boils that slowly all day long. And yeah. we take the alcohol that we put in and we basically boil it off. So if I was Rachel Ray or Martha Stewart, right now I'd be teaching you how to make a simple syrup, right? How do we make simple <laughs> syrup? If you take a bag of sugar and pour it into a quart of water, you just make this slimy, granular, yucky mess. But with the art of science, what have we learned? If you boil water, you can concentrate something that dissolves into it using heat. So we boil the water and you pour the sugar in there and now you make syrup. And so we're making basically honey syrup. Wow. From alcohol. So what we want to do is I want to be able to add the honey to that bottle or to our batch and have the honey stay dissolved in mm. the, the, the alcohol. Because what we could do, Paul, you could just take honey. If you're making a cocktail, you could make vodka and you just, dribble. Oh, yes. you just, just dribble in there, shake it up and then drink yeah. it and then let it separate in your tummy. Well, we don't want that because it's got to sit on a shelf and it's got to look beautiful. So to do that, we use heat and the honey and the alcohol and instead of using water, it bonds with the molecules of the alcohol awesome. so that when my colleague and I take these huge kettles and we put the honey in our vodka, it forms and stays in solution. And so this bottle, if this was four months old, that's exactly what it looks like. And I think you look in there, there's no gloppy honey at the bottom, right? Yeah, absolutely, right. So it's beautiful, but it's very simple. It's just all natural honey. And we get all of our honey. It started off that we got it from the hives up at Salish Lodge. But we now get all of our honey from uh, our local beekeeper, Danny Sullivan with Shipwreck Honey. He's really right out the window of the distillery up in West Seattle. And he's got um, basically what's called zip code hives. He takes them. And in the spring, he'll go down to the Olympia area and all the raspberry fields south of Olympia. And... Um, this summer, he'll go up and do lavender fields up in the islands and up north near Bellingham. Nice. And then in the fall, if they can, they'll even take the hives, uh, the hives down and they'll distribute around some of the rivers around and they'll get milkweed um, uh, nectar. And so our product is also reflective of that because the nectar that the bees are retrieving from these different plants also have different pollen and the pollen is what stains honey a different color. And it's gonna, so it's gonna taste different. different. It's gonna have a different correct character to it, right? You got it, you got it. And it gives nice. it a different aromatic character. We, mm -hmm. uh, um, we do these batches. And so the, the honey that comes off in the spring and early summer tends to be a lot lighter. And the mm -hmm. honey that we get in the fall tends to be a little bit darker. What's this one that's, that was in the tasting? This is a spring honey from raspberry. And um, I can teach people out. There's a little code that's on here uh, on the back of that we put on our UPC code so that we know. But if you look on there, it actually shows what the, uh, the honey is. So it's very so, pleasant. It's, it, it's very sweet. And um, the honey is really subtle. It's thank even, you. the subtleness it's in there. It's not that cloyingly sweet fake honey no, flavor. No, and not at all. It's very, it's very natural. Mm hmm. But it's not what over. Do you think, it's a good, he loves it. Yeah, right on. All right. It, anybody at home drink champagne? It's this really bubbly, beautiful wine people use to celebrate. I don't know. I've, 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 I've understood it's quite nice. This in your champagne is a very mm. cool old school cocktail that ah. um, people used to uh, make this with gin. We take mm. champagne. So take an ounce of glass nectar. Add some champagne and then a dribble of lemon juice. The lemon juice helps balance mm. the sweetness from the, the nectar. And then the, the champagne adds the, um, the effervescence. It's a beautiful old school cocktail. 
So that's great. That's a great idea. Awesome. Thank you. When you taste that, you do get it, but it's not that cloyingly fake flavor. It's just sweet enough. And this is what we're going to feature you guys in the glass slipper cocktail that we're going to do towards uh, in just a few minutes. Nice. So remember that, that flavor and you'll see how it comes out when, when we're making it with the Aperol. Now we're going to get into more, uh, a little bit more intense flavors. I won't say too intense, but it's, it's because of the color. Now let's look for the glass spice, right? See that too much reflection? Glass spice. Yeah. So Paul, <laughs> glass spice is glass vodka that we infuse, decide how much you want, that we infuse with Ceylon cinnamon. Ceylon cinnamon is really, it's some of the finest cinnamon that we could find in the world. Um, it comes from Sri Lanka. We deal directly with the plantation in Sri Lanka. They shave it off the trees in, in little bark sleeves and they roll them into to long quills for us. And then we directly infuse that by just soaking the quills for a couple of weeks in the product and mm -hmm. then we polish it again. We don't want to remove the color and the flavor, but sure. you can see that it's got like almost a beautiful brandy color to it. Absolutely. And this one, I mean, if this doesn't remind you of grandma's cinnamon rolls and apple pie in the fall, I don't know what does. But oh, that's nice. Yeah. You see, no sugar. I didn't no. add anything to this. This is it's just on cinnamon. Pure, pure cinnamon. I love it. And about four pounds of fructose. I know. I'm sorry. No, we don't. I don't add fructose. I don't want to add hey, anything to it. I, it looks like I've got a question though. Going back to the honey. Yeah. Lemon juice with the champagne should be added to yes. that nectar. Yes. A little bit of lemon juice. Just a touch. Just a touch. Like a, a half a teaspoon. And sure. it's it, it's the balance of the acidity mm -hmm. and the sweetness of the honey that makes it that that's what makes it taste good we sure. as, as humans we always we, we appreciate things that we taste that are balanced and some of us don't know why but it's just that's what it is if something's too salty we know it's out of balance from salt and just the same way with sweetness or bitterness yeah. and so that that's what helps balance that cocktail i, I really like the the cinnamon it's and i could see how it would be a nice real flavor to a, another cocktail or something i mean i could drink it, it like that but as a, as a compliment to another cocktail would be really great too. I like that the, the earthiness to it. It's got mm -hmm. the woodiness to it. it. This is great just to sip on its own in a brandy snifter. Sure. I think one of the biggest surprise cocktails that, that I've experienced with it over the years, I had a bartender in Michigan that, that made a Moscow mule with this. Oh, and it wow. was so obvious using ginger and cinnamon together with a little lime juice. But nice. um, I... I, I've, I've really enjoyed all these different cocktails that people come up with, but it's just that little sweet cinnamon flavor that you get from it. It's not that hot, burny dentine. It's real sure. sweet cinnamon. Well, we should put that out to everybody who's watching. If you drink these and you think of then other combinations, put that in the chat um, because we'll see that uh, as we're going through, but also everybody who watches this, that's one of the great things about these virtual tastings that we're doing since we can't be together. You've been at the Science Center, right? When we've had the whole Science Center taken over by tastings of multiple um, yeah. dealers, right? We missed that. This is a great opportunity to do that. We've got about 50 people watching right now. That's but great. We'll be watching this afterwards as well. And so- I, I bet you, Paul, right now, there are people that are watching that have been to the tastings at the Science I'm, Center. I'm sure. I'm we, sure we really loved being there for those events because everyone just so interested in, in what we've been what we've been up okay. to and all the other distilleries that were there. We miss we oh. miss getting there together. All right, we're going on to Kona. Let's go to Kona. Dark. So this huh? is from Hawaii, right? Yeah. So I'm telling everybody that's watching right now, if you need to take an alcohol break, um, the only reason to take an alcohol break on this one is if you don't like coffee, because if you don't like coffee. You're not going to learn to like it right now because this <laughs> is like drinking your first shot of espresso. It okay. is a, this is a beautiful espresso and vodka finishing alcohol. When you I even smell, smell some chocolate in there. I oh think. yeah. So oh. this, this is, uh, this is um, coffee that we get from the Hapuna Kihei estate on the big island of Hawaii through wow. our company partner called seven coffee roasters. They get this coffee, we bring it over here green, we roast it, 
and then we do a cold brew extract. So oh. when you smell that, those chocolate, those vanilla, that toasted wood notes, that's because it's real Kona coffee. Oh yeah, okay, by so the way. Here's, here's the difference. My husband's over there going, mm, I'm not sure. I don't, he doesn't like as strong coffee as I do. This, this one is right up my alley. I, you know what's right up your alley too? If you what's drink that? caffeine, this. Because uh, my colleague just reminded me to, to tell everyone, uh, by the way, this is caffeinated because it's real coffee and it's been sitting when we do this for a while. So um, this is a, this is like having a cup of coffee in the morning. So if uh, you, so you'll, you'll notice from this, when you taste it, it's warm. It's like espresso, it's got beautiful coffee flavor, but again, it's not sweet because coffee doesn't naturally have sugar in it. So mm -hmm. if you like your coffee with stevia, with honey, with sugar, whatever you mm -hmm. like it in, I implore you to do that with your glass Kona, but well, I'm not going to put it in there for you. We just went out to dinner and we got a, we had a nice Italian place. I got my little espresso uh, and I did what I normally do. And I say, can I have a little bit of Frangelico? Yeah. But this yeah. as a nice little side with the espresso just would be a beautiful combination. Thank you. I'm loving well, it. We, I, 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 we have well, somebody so said make a white Russian with this too, and mm -hmm. uh, but you can just think of anything with a with a, a coffee base to it. But espresso martinis, this one is as simple as put an ounce and a half of this in a shaker, add some okay. cream or milk, and shake it up with some ice or pour it over the rocks. And I'm telling you, the dude would tell you it's a white Russian. <laughs> That's exactly what Wendy M just said. It's a white Russian. Thank you, Wendy. Sure. The dude thanks you too. <laughs> The dude likes. Okay, so. Somebody mentioned that they've been to the live tastings. Michelle, thanks for mentioning that. You've been to the live tasting event. It's nice not to have to wait in line. Right, exactly. Oh, it's great. And you can right here or doing our tasting. Yeah, beautiful. Okay, so now let's get on to one thing that's a little bit, this is the, this is really, uh, I think our flavors are quite unique. And the fact that we use all natural uh, flavors and they're, they're infused and we're not adding extra sugars or any other flavors, one thing. But this one right here, this is gonna be the thing that people I think are gonna be shocked with. This is called Selkirk. Selkirk is named after, if you look on the label and the very, the very small little coat of arms that we got there, see the yeah. two Labradors? One yeah. of those Labradors was named Chivas. He was my yellow Labrador. The other one was named Selkirk. She was my black lab. Uh, Selkirk means uh, white church in Gaelic. So sort of a dumb name for a black Labrador. But nonetheless, I thought it was a good name. The name was, I made this barrel-aged vodka. It is barrel-aged vodka. It's vodka that is, sit, that is sat in a charred oak barrel for two years. And what it extracts is flavors and aromatics that would remind you of a single malt, a Highland. For those of you who know single malt Scotch whiskey, this is not like Lafroy. This is not like Talisker. This is more like Glen Morangy. This is more like um, Glen Livet, a Highland single malt. Mm. So it's bottled at a hundred proof. It's bottled at a hundred proof because I think when you smell this, Paul, you've started to smell that. I started to smell it a little bit, yeah. The vanilla and caramel yeah. notes that you smell, when you add enough water to get it down to 80 proof, or what we've learned, 40% alcohol, 40 proof, yeah, right. it takes away just enough of the aromatics that I think it's it, it, there's less to appreciate in it. It's so subtle, but I really like this level now, in there. Barrel, barrel age is a lot of a scotch. Now, I, years ago, I actually did a tasting of scotches, uh, uh, whiskey, um, and learned a little bit about a scotch. So where do you get the barrels from? We Did actually buy the barrels for this product. Yeah. I buy these are, these are new American oak okay. barrels. You get them out of Kentucky. Sure. And they would be used for bourbon. So right. yeah. here's another misnomer. Not necessarily science, but I'll tell you. Some people think that bourbon can only be made in Kentucky. That's, well, yes, that's, what, that's the truth. That's, that's how it is, isn't it? It is not the truth. Paul, this could be your fourth thing that you've learned today. Maybe <laughs> seven. I don't know. I lost count. 
You're like a student here, man. <laughs> so bourbon actually has a definition and it has nothing to do with the state. But mm. one of the things that it has to do with, it has to be made of a mash bill or the grains that are used has to be at least 51% American grown corn. Okay. And it has to be aged for at least two years in new American oak that's been charred. So it, you can't use a French oak barrel or Hungarian oak barrel. You got to use it has American, to be American. Oak. Yeah. And it has to be the first and only use of it. So you can't use an, uh, okay. a used bourbon barrel. It's got to be a brand new bourbon barrel. So and you uh, got new barrels to do this. We did. And okay. so it extracts that color and you can see yeah. that golden color. Yeah. It extracts that color in just a few weeks. Wow. And uh, uh, we get the sweetness. We get uh, nice. oh. that lovely. We love it over here. <laughs> I don't know what you all say, but uh, it's really nice. It's sweet, It's but it's not sugary. It's, yeah. It's woody, but it's not overdone. It's sure. got that vanilla character, but then you find even at even tasting at room temperature at 50% alcohol, it doesn't have a hot burn finish. Not at all. And so you you're taking this vodka, letting it age in the barrels, but you've got to water it down because it's got to get to 40 or 50%, right? Because it's flavored. Yeah, so we're, we're, we're aging it at about 60% alcohol. 60%, okay. And then we water it down to 50% alcohol. Yeah, nice. Right? So I, I'd love it if you, if, you, if you like that, please come on in. We've got some different iterations that we've done with this. We even aged That's it with a bourbon beautiful. barrel from one of, uh, one of Seattle's other great distilleries, Two Bar Spirits. And we did a special bottling that is was just 120 bottles or crystal bottles etched with the logo of two bar and glass distillery. It's got oh, a I love it. flavor. Wait, before you go on to the next thing, because oh, we we are just wrapping and getting close to doing cocktails. Where where is the combination with glass and vodka? What does that all come from? So my my real reason for calling it glass in the beginning is. I have a passion for a couple things in from Washington State. One is the wonderful fruit that we grow in this state to make some mm -hmm. world-class wines, really, truly some of the best wines in the world. Absolutely. And I'm very proud of the growers and the wineries in this state. So I wanted to do something that we could celebrate that, but not compete against all my friends who are such great winemakers. We don't need another hack like me in, in doing <laughs> wine. But I wanted to be able to celebrate that, do something that, that celebrates these, these products. But glass is also one of the gifts to the world from Absolutely. Washington State. Yeah. And, and pioneers in the glass art movement and the studio glass world like Dale Chihuly and, and Lino Talapietra in Washington State They've led this, this movement so that people can make a living blowing mm -hmm. glass and working glass, but glass is really a liquid art form. Absolutely. And it, it, we really, it's taking sand and adding enough heat that it, it becomes liquid. But the only reason it's liquid is because of the temperature and alcohol is really the same thing. It's a liquid art form. I, I think which we've tasted thus far you can see these are these are artistic expressions of what I believe they should taste like, Absolutely. and that's hard, right? Now you might. Absolutely. Not, we have probably viewers and tasters at home that some of them are saying, "Oh my gosh, this, this is fantastic," and others are saying, eh, "I like tequila," but that's that's what art is. And it's so, art and science. Let's just make art it and science. Art and science together, right? Yeah. And you, you can't do it without the other. You can't just be creative if you don't understand the chemistry and the art and the science of it. Mm. Oh. I'm gonna drink that other than rather than scotches. I, I, I'm I'm on that. You will be shocked at the cocktails that I have that we have on on our website. Check it That's, out, Paul, because um, there's some beautiful cocktails. And you'll also be shocked how fast you drink a bottle if you just sit down <laughs> at the bar and start uh, pouring a glass or two with friends. You may need two bottles. <laughs> well. Drink responsibly, people. Drink responsibly. Great. Please drink responsibly at home. At home. Mask up and then take it off. So, shall we make a couple cocktails to kind of round this out? Oh, I love it. And, and I, I'm all prepared. I, I looked at the website. I got a couple of materials. I don't know if I got Thai basil, but I got some basil. So, you just lead us through how to make You got it. You got it. So, hey, everyone, I, I, I did prepare 
some of the things right here in advance so that it was, was faster, but it's just, I've got cucumber for the one drink, lemon, the Thai basil, and, um, and we'll use that to garnish, but you can see these are pretty quick. So let's do the first one, this is a glass slipper, okay? This is the one that was made at Lule. A buddy of mine, Dan Roberts, he's one of the bartenders. You'll know him if you've been into Lule, he's got a kick-ass handlebar mustache. And uh, he came up with this drink. So we're gonna use nectar. We're gonna use Aperol. Everybody know what Aperol is. Aperol is an Italian liquor, uh, liqueur. It's really, um, it's orange and some other are their secret spices. And then we're just gonna use a little bit of vermouth, just a, a dash of vermouth. And, and I, uh, I grabbed uh, dry vermouth, is that right? That's totally great. That's totally great. And you'll see, remember we were talking about balance earlier, Paul? Mm -hmm. What balances this cocktail is the, the tartness and bitterness of Aperol and the vermouth with the sweetness of glass nectar. And that's what makes this uh, this drink so great. So um, I think what, what the best way to do this, this is a cocktail that is served up. So up means in a martini glass. Got it. Look at that. I have, uh, everybody have a shaker. Did you get a shaker? I, I have my favorite shaker here. It's uh, I, I have this. Uh, that, oh, God, that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, it's, I, I think it's an appropriate Seattle shaker because, you know, we, we, we now okay. paint everything that's uh, of horizontal and vertical surfaces. So I got myself a Seattle shaker. Nice. And uh, you want to fill your shaker with some ice. I hope you all are following along with us. Uh, the ingredients are on the website. Um, it's going to be on packside.org events and science of spirits you can find those instructions there you got it so where did i put my nectar right over here so your typical shot glass is one and a half ounces so we're going to do if you didn't quaff it all down on your first you should have enough to in your sample kit to make this cocktail with your glass nectar so one and a half ounces of glass nectar about uh, a half an ounce of Aperol, and that's more to lead to taste, so that's a half an ounce of Aperol. And then really, this is just a dash of vermouth. This just helps balance the cocktail. So there's your dash of vermouth. Make sure you get your uh, shaker on good and tight because you don't want to leak everywhere, so. Just a dash, huh? Okay. Hey, and you'll see this has got a nice orange color. Yeah. The harder you shake, the more water you add to your drink. Did you know that? That's why we serve a drink up, Paul. You add because. ice to the shaker. The alcohol mixes with the ice and actually melts the ice. And so when Absolutely. you serve it up, you're adding water to it. But unlike serving something on the rocks, each sip is going to have the same taste from the top of the glass to the bottom of the glass. Now I've got a question from, from the um, YouTube. Somebody says that they don't have, Andrew says he doesn't have vermouth. He's going to try balsamic vinegar. Is that a good? Oh, interesting. That's just a good twist on it. Way to go. Uh, yeah, Wendy, we think we're, I'm using dry I don't know if you're using sweet vermouth. But this is a dry vermouth. And this is, a, yeah. you know, there's white vermouth, there's red vermouth, there's darks, there's dry, there's sweet. Um, a drier vermouth helps balance this. So Paul, see what you think of that drink. Let's give you a, give you a live impression of what you think. Oh, I mean, I, first off, already the, 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 the flavor, the, the smell of it uh, is wonderful. I think that the orange from the Aperol and the sweetness from the honey together. Um, when Dan makes these for us down there at Lule, uh, it's like Kool-Aid. Yeah, it's very light. It, 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 it uh, is almost, it's almost a full mixture of uh, 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 a mixed drink, but it really isn't, right? It's very, very light. I'm gonna take one more sip and then you can have some. <laughs> oh, that's really very nice. Oh, that's great. 
Okay, so let's go a completely different direction. That one has got the, the nectar and the orange and, um, and it balances off with the vermouth. Let's go a different direction. This one I do like to serve up because this is how wild ginger likes to serve this. This is a drink that, that was came up with the, the wild ginger, you know, a great restaurant, Seattle, uh, downtown Seattle has got a couple locations. Absolutely, in Belgium. we miss it's them. The yeah. Infamous long place they've been around. So you get my other shaker, to your shaker, your Thai basil. Add some Thai basil, just leaves of Thai basil and add some ice. And you want to add one and a half ounces of fresh lemonade. So but I, I really like this brand. I have nothing to do with it. I just really like the flavor of it. It's Santa Cruz lemonade. It's in a lot of stores. It's an organic lemonade. It's not fake. It's not made from concentrate. So it's real lemon flavor. I'll tell you what I've got right here is yeah. um, lemons from Imperfect Produce is a great partner who's been to the Science Center oh. as well. And we... We just cut them up, froze it, and then I made it into a lemonade, so. That sounds even better than what I've got. I like anything fresh like that. Now, if you really want to get a lot of flavor out of this thing, if you have a tool like this, it's a muddler. So we created this muddler in-house. They're made from exotic hardwoods. It's got two different ends on it. If your hand's really big, you can use it and jab down in. It's long so that your hand doesn't get smashed against the uh, the edges of your sh of your uh, shaker. But you do this. We're gonna muddle in the bottom that tie basil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mix yeah. It with the uh, the lemon. Just do this. Is that a shucker? It's fine. It's totally fine. I wouldn't hold it like this, though, Paul. You might do more damage. Your husband would be taking it. Do it up in it responsibly. <laughs> now, oh, that's good. once you muddle, you'll see it breaks up that smell. And it, I mean, it breaks up that uh, those leaves of the basil. It makes it way more aromatic. It's mixing with the lemonade in there. And um, again, we're going to use a, an ice-filled glass, so a rocks glass. If you want to get really fancy, you can make those solid uh, ice ball cubes that look like a, like a golf ball, if you know what I mean. Or just fill your glass up. Uh, the cucumber gives a nice, um, like light, crispy summertime flavor with the Thai okay. basil. And um, I also like to add a, a, a sprig of basil to it for, for the color and, and uh, nice. for the look of it. And then to this, we just add glass vodka. So we're gonna add uh, about an ounce and three quarters. So a little more than a strong double shot. So that would be an ounce and a half. And then the, the quarter ounce that I just poured on my bars, not gonna go to any good use. Oh, uh, I heard I heard awe from the uh, from peanut gallery here. So <laughs> now you've added your, your vodka to the cocktail. Now we've mixed the two together. You get the sugar, the vodka, uh, from the sugar from the lemonade there. You'll see it's got just a nice light green color, mm -hmm. glass gimlet. It's light, refreshing. It's good in the middle of the winter when you go to, to Wild Ginger. We have poured this cocktail many times. It's always a fan mm -hmm. favorite. It's it was actually, Paul, this was the cocktail that was served for a year at the Delta Sky Clubs in Seattle when they opened the new Sky Club Lounge. And we, we <laughs> called it, um, uh, Delta made up some fancy name for it, but it was really this, the glass gimlet. That's wonderful. That's great. We got one question. What's the backstory behind the sodas that we got in the kit? Oh, good. Let's do that. Because I know we're, we're, we're a little bit over time, but in your kit, I think everybody got these these magic cups, right? Not if it was shipped. Darn it! I was just told by the peanut gallery if it was shipped, you didn't get them. So I'll tell you oh, what. Shoot. Pop down to I the got them. Did you get some, Paul? I got some, yeah. If y'all come down to the distillery, I'll give you these cups. They're magic cups. It's really science. Magic science. So you get a clear cup. 
You add some ice to it. Take your favorite vodka soda. You guys, I did this as sort of a special thing for y'all because it was, a, it was for the tasting. We've taken our vodka, we've added sparkling water, we've added the essence of uh, real fruit. So Meyer lemon, mm. ruby white grapefruit, mandarin orange, and then just straight vodka soda. There's actually no flavor. There's no sugar, there's no sweeteners. It really tastes like a vodka soda that you'd added a slice of lemon sure. and not squeeze the juice out of it. So like one of the more favorite drinks at most bars is a vodka soda and people want a lemon or a lime. The unflavored version is so that you can add whatever your favorite garnish is. The others are popular flavors that we liked. We even know the ranches and the farms that we get the essential oils we add to That's these amazing. things. Wow. It doesn't matter. You guys see it because we're doing the tasting. It just tastes good. And if you put it in your magic cup, you'll see as the cup gets cold, the product is clear, but as the cup gets cold, it changes color. It's just nice. like mountains on your Coors Light can. <laughs> and the peanut gallery back here is laughing because they don't even know what Coors Light is, but cheers, guys. Ian, thank you so much. This is really, really amazing. I mean, I love the fact that we learned a little bit about science. We got to taste some great uh, vodkas, learned a little bit about how to make some good cocktails. Uh, I know my family will appreciate that. <laughs> and I really appreciate all of your support uh, of the Science Center and curiosity overall. I really appreciate it. Paul, we love it. We're happy to support the Science Center. We can't wait till you guys are back open. I know there's so many families out there that just love to get into Science Center, let their kids be entertained and learn something. Um, it'll happen. We'll be back. I we'll be back know. soon. And thank you so much, Ian. Thank you to everyone who joined in. Um, we really appreciate you sticking with us all the way through this. Um, tell your friends about it. Tell your friends about a glass vodka. Tell your friends about Paxi and the work that we're doing to try to keep curiosity alive and uh, that curiosity never closes. If you haven't already, visit Glass Vodka and visit Paxi at paxi.org slash support. We really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much, Ian, really. We really appreciate everybody's time spending it with us this evening. Thanks everybody. Thank you Thank so you much. All. Salute. Salute. <laughs>